Hey you geeks, the Wheel of Time on Prime is like winter, and you know what they say. And winter is coming. Eventually. I guess they both arrive in November. Not gonna lie, I slated this video for today in the hopes that I could use footage from the trailer drop at Comic Con. Well, that's what I get for trying to be clever. I got into this series as a tied me over until book 5 of the Stormlight Archive, though this hype about the show didn't hurt either. When it comes to adaptations, as an Avatar The Last Airbender fan, I'm always a little leery. There are two routes I'm fine with adaptations going. The first route being Lord of the Rings, where it stuck fairly close to the meat of the story and were wonderful films. That still only counts as one. The other direction is harder to pull off, the Hayao Miyazaki's take on Howl's Moving Castle. Miyazaki took this quintessential English fairy tale and turned it into an authentic anime, adding a whole new subplot and ending, and turning Howl into a bird man. You, you can't even break your own spell. It's not at all book accurate, but it's so wonderful, I don't care. However, Rafe says they're going for a more faithful adaptation style. Obviously, I want to stay as close to the books as we possibly can. You know, these are, are really beloved books, but they also, I love them. There's a great story there. We want to tell it, and we want to tell it in the way that's best for television. Like but they will still make changes. And here are seven changes I'm fine with them making. Now, I'm coming to this as a new fan who's barely made it halfway through the books, and this video will possibly contain spoilers up through Lord of Chaos. I don't know for certain what will be essential to the plot, but I've got a general sketch of where the threads from the first two books ended up. So if I make some fatal flaw, be sure to mention it down in the comments. Release the Badger! One of my original critiques of Matt in the first book is that everyone says he's a prankster, but we never actually see him pull a prank. This kinda works in a written medium, but there is no excuse in a visual medium to have Matt just ask Rand if he wants to release a badger. I want to see him release the badger, or at the very least do something. Steal a pie to foreshadow the knife debacle? Then we can meet Nynaeve as she grabs him by the ear. I might have known. In the vein of seeing Matt be a trickster, I am also the most fine with him using real world swear words. I love that Jordan took the time to build in world curses, and the show should not neglect them. But the show doesn't have a hundred thousand words to immerse the reader into the world. I accept A Knight's Tale's logic for using classic rock in a soundtrack. Loot music may have been what got medieval Europeans excited at the tournament, but modern audiences get excited to rock music. So, as long as the show uses real-world swears, in keeping with the characters, Nynaeve should never swear, but Matt deserves an F-bomb or two each season, that would get new fans up to speed real quick on who these characters are in a fraction of the time. Handsome, clever, rich. We never see Egwene's character from her own perspective during the first book. We see her mostly through Rand's eyes as his crush and Lady Fair. Come on, Lady Fair, let's go! Her actions do speak for themselves, hinting at a very large ego beneath the surface, but she's kind of a flat character in the first book. If the show is going to flesh her out more in the early stages, I hope she will be lovably snobby. How you hate to be wrong. I wouldn't know. I'm not familiar with the sensation. Someone like the Dowager Countess of Grantham, though the Dowager can get away with a lot because she's old, like Linny. However, the young Cher from Clueless pulls off a young snob just as well. 
They're like dogs. You have to clean them and feed them, and they're just like these nervous creatures that jump and slobber all over you. Ew! Get off of me! Ugh, as if! Like them, Egwene is self-confident to a fault, but they can still care in their own way about others. Maybe Egwene could attempt some empathy towards Perrin's furry little problem. In the book she didn't react, which I read as neutral, the show could make the audience love Egwene if she shows one speck of regard for Perrin having a rough time, even in the most Egwene way possible. Then she can go run off with the Tinker Boy because pursuing her own pleasures while the world burns is an unfortunate habit of hers. A Balanced Relationship Like Egwene, Nynaeve's story is mostly conveyed through Rand's perspective, and Rand is an idiot when it comes to women. The Eye of the World does give us a few chapters with her perspective so she gets a bit more fleshed out. However, the show has an excellent opportunity to show us things Rand does not see about her, such as her budding relationship with Lan. There is some chemistry between them in the book, but it goes from grudging competition to Land refusing to make a marriage proposal. What did I miss? What did I miss? It would be great to see their relationship grow in a way that is keeping with their characters. Nynaeve would, of course, keep her good stout two rivers sense of propriety, and Land can do his rock imitation. Through the show, we can see Land's stoicism complement and balance Nynaeve's high spirits in the way I think Jordan meant to convey. Rafe talks about balance being a big part of the show. Right now, a, a story that is really about balance is something that's meaningful in the world. I'm always down for a yin-yang themed romantic relationship. However, Jordan prioritized Rand's perspective in these early books at the expense of exploring Nynaeve and Lan. Now that the camera is free to have a third-person perspective, I hope they use it wisely. Wolves. I'm not sure how far into Perrin's arc this season will go. I don't think Elias is a known cast member, so that points to Perrin not discovering his powers in the first season. That's kind of a bummer for me and Lopin. Perrin's fight between the wolves and the white cloaks is one of our favorite parts in the first book. We were also kind of bummed that Perrin didn't use the wolves to help cross the blight. Once again, Jordan limited us to Rand's perspective for that sequence, so what Perrin was thinking remains a mystery. Even if we don't get Elias, Wolves doing something like attacking parents' enemies would be cool. Wolf. 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 Ah. Frankly, without Elias there to explain it, parents' terror at the thought of having wolves in his head is a lot more understandable. In the book, the only people who hate wolves are white cloaks, and in the book, their opinion doesn't count for much. White Cloak Ninjas The White Cloaks were probably the most threatening in the eye of the world and only got more ridiculous as far as I've read. Yet even in the eye of the world, they seemed rather silly. That ceremony is ridiculously elaborate. If one of the White Cloaks' stated goals is to hunt down Aes Sedai, then shouldn't they be more equipped to do just that? None of their shiny armor or menacing postures has been effective at taking down an Aes Sedai in 3,000 years. you think they would have tried something more effective at least once. Dark friends notwithstanding, they're kind of like Wily e. Coyote at this point. Meep, meep. The only way I've seen non-magic users take down a channeler was through stealth, and that worked, though rarely. Instead of having the super evil wing of the White Cloaks be the Inquisitors lurking somewhere off page, I'd love to see a crack squad of stealth White Cloak witch hunters like ninjas successfully sneak up on and capture an Aes Sedai. They can then haul her off screen to confess her sins and yada yada. 
If the show gave the Hand of the Light a ninja or stealth squad, I would take them much more seriously. Loghain goes crazy! We already know that Loghain Ablar will have a larger role in the show than he does in the book. I'm pretty excited because I'm already a Loghain fangirl, though I would be more excited if he shaved his beard. But I guess that he's the rough cut false dragon on the run in this book, so the scruffiness makes sense. Who's scruffy looking? If we're seeing more of him, I hope we get to see the world other type of witch hunt, where the witches are the hunters. Do not underestimate the women in this tower. Let's see some reds in action and Logan's response. The show has a great opportunity to show both Aes Sedai ruthlessness and male channeling madness in a way that makes us fear and sympathize with both sides. Thus far, the only madness I've seen Loghain have is post-gentling depression and the extreme lengths he goes to fight it, nine horse hitches and whatnot. I'd love to see him with powers and somewhat insane. I'm invincible! You're a loony. I really hope they pull this off. The eye of the world matters. Sanderson has said that one of the hardest parts of finishing the story was keeping the Forsaken threatening until the very end. Six books in and I can see his point. The show having the benefit of hindsight can keep the power levels and Forsaken roster manageable to make each conflict seem truly dire. We are As much as I love the Eye of the World sequence, it name drops far too many Forsaken and Rand apparently defeats the Dark One with a sword. We also don't get a sense of how the Eye of the World itself is important in the larger story. Sure, the Dark One says he's going to use it to slay the World Serpent, but this never comes up again. Is it even a part of the Curiathon cycle? Sure, Rand picked up a few items of importance at the eye, but save maybe the dragon banner, none of these seemed like they had to be there. They could have been found in just any old cave. However, I am not writing the show, and it appears that the first season will take us to Faldara, especially since the new poster shows Moraine entering the ways. This is a moment where you see our lead, Rosamund Pike, Moiraine, looking back over her shoulder and saying, like, you don't know what's through here, but come along for the ride. By the way, am I saying Moiraine wrong? Let me know down in the comments. Not that I will change, but it's good to know. Back to the poster. If they are going to the eye of the world, I would cut Ishamayel and Bialzaman, saving them for the Stone of Tear. Just have Rand face Agnor while the women and the green man square off against that other Forsaken whose name I don't feel like looking up. Agnor could even be the one to haunt Rand's dreams. I chose Agnor because his name came up again in Lord of Chaos as the one who invented the worms which roam the blight. A battle with Agnor in command of his pets would save a load of later exposition and make a worthwhile threat, while also not forcing Rand to insane power levels in the first season. It's over 9,000! All in all, I would be thrilled if the show made these changes, but I could still be happy if it goes a completely different direction than what I have imagined. Heck, that might make me happier if it's done well. If the show is not done well, then I won't like it regardless of how they trimmed the plot. What are your thoughts? What changes would you not mind seeing in the show? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.